All right, welcome back. Let's get started with uh, today's today's lecture. There will be a, a homework review video posted just as soon as class ends. I uh, finished it but didn't have time to post it yet. So that'll be up for the, the first homework assignment on Chapter 7, um, which covers most of, of that chapter. Uh, the, the scores were a little bit lower this time, but that's understandable given all the events of last week. So try to look over some of those things and, and get caught up on them. Now what we're going to continue with today is talking about the ideal gas law. So last time we talked about some individual laws dealing with certain properties of gases and the four major properties of gases that are important for us are going to be pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. And at the very end we saw how those could be combined into a single equation which is called the ideal gas law, the combined gas law. Um, because remember that for each of those individual laws we talked about, they have their own equation associated with them. There's four different parameters, four different variables. You could write you know, six different equations that involve two of those variables. You could write a bunch of other ones that involve three of the four variables. So that's a lot of equations to try to consider separately, but this ideal gas law is one single equation that we can always use when, when talking about properties of gases. So what we're going to start with today is in the, you know, in the backdrop of that equation that we finished sort of talking about in abstract on Friday, let's see a bunch of different types of problems we can do involving this, um, this type of equation. So let's start with one here. So there's, again, the equation that we're interested in is PV equals NRT, a very familiar ideal gas equation. And we can now talk about different ways that we can use this in doing problems. So there, there are two basic types of problems you're going to have to do. In one of them, like we're starting with here, we're just talking about a sample of gas. We have, you know, PV, N, R, and T, or certain PV, N, and T are the variables here. And we give you three of those variables and ask you to solve for the fourth one. So a very straightforward application where it's just one equation, one unknown. The other type of problem that we'll see a lot of also is where you have sort of initial and final conditions. So you have a sample of gas, you're changing one or more things about it, and you want to know how that affects one of the other variables. So there's kind of two different ways we can use this. The first one here, we just have a 0.1 mole sample of neon gas, which occupies a volume of 2,503 milliliters and exerts a pressure of 551 torr. What is the temperature of the gas? So all we have here is just one sample of gas. We're not changing anything about the pressure of the volume or the number of moles. We just want to find the unknown missing variable, which is temperature. So starting with PV equals NRT, we can solve for temperature. Which is PV divided by NR. And now we just have to start putting things in. Now we do have to be careful with units for the ideal gas equation. And this is especially true if we're using the value of R. If we're using R as part of our calculation, so here we need the value of R in this, R is of the universal gas constant. Remember that R has a, has a value of 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per K mole. So if our computation involves the value of R as part of it, which it does here, we need to make sure that we use the units that correspond with that. We need to have liters for the volume, we need to have atmospheres for the pressure. Temperature should always be in Kelvin for gas calculations, no matter what. And then, of course, the amount of substance is always going to be in moles. But we need to make sure we have liters and atmospheres specifically to make the units work out for this. So the pressure and the volume are given to us differently here, so we need to convert them. So we need the pressure to be in atmospheres. And so remember that the conversion we use for that is we have 551 torr, and then there's going to be this relationship of one atmosphere is 760. Zero point seven two five atmospheres. So that's going to be the pressure that we put in. The volume we were given in milliliters that needs to be in liters if we're using the universal gas constant. So we have two thousand five hundred three milliliters, and then one liter has a volume of one thousand milliliters. All right. So we have to remember our prefixes to be able to do this one. So it's going to be two point. 503 liters. So units is probably half the battle in this problem. Okay, temperature needs to be in Kelvin, but that's what we're solving for, so that'll work out. And then we need the number of moles. We have 0 0.1 moles that's given to us directly. And then R, as I said, is 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere per k mole. 
There's another value of R that's on your periodic table and that we'll use later on, but that's dealing more with energy calculations. Okay, so atmospheres cancels, liters cancel, moles cancel, and so we get a value in Kelvin, which is going to be 221 Kelvin. This one didn't specify the, the unit for the temperature, but that would be equal to minus 52 degrees Celsius if we were asked to convert to Celsius. So we just subtract 273 to get that into Celsius. Okay? So that's going to be the answer for that one. So this is a pretty straightforward application of the ideal gas law. It's a simple equation. We have one unknown. We solve for that unknown. And the, the main thing to be aware of is to have our quantities in the correct units, so specifically liters and atmospheres for pressure and volume. All right, so any questions on that one? Now, most of the other problems we're going to do are going to involve a sample of gas that has something changing about it, where the volume, pressure, temperature, or, or sometimes number of moles is changing. So that, this is going to be an example of that here. So we have, we blow up a balloon uh, to a volume of 255 milliliters with a pr pressure of 912 torr and the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. And then we release that balloon into the atmosphere and it rises up to a point where the, the temperature is minus 23 degrees Celsius and the pressure has dropped to 2.28 torr. What is the volume of the balloon under these conditions? All right. So when we're doing these types of problems, we're changing something about a sample of gas. Here we, we we're told that the pressure and the temperature are changing. We want to know what the new volume is under those conditions. Um, we start always with the ideal gas equation. So we don't have to remember the individual gas laws. Or we don't have to remember eight different equations that describe all these. We just start with this one. And then the, the trick that we're always going to play is we're going to take this ideal gas equation and Everything that's constant in the problem, everything that's not changing, we're going to move it to one side. So if we look at the problem here that we have, we're, we're not told anything about the number of moles. So typically if you're not told something about one of the values, it's, you're going to assume that it's constant. But here we also have a closed balloon. So assuming our balloon isn't leaking or isn't going to pop on us, the number of moles of gas is the same. There's the same amount of gas inside of that balloon before and after. So number of moles is constant. And then when we're using the ideal gas equation, R is always a constant. So number of moles is constant because it's a closed container. And also we're not told what the number of moles is, so we can't even put that in. And then R is always a constant because this is the universal gas constant. It doesn't change from, from problem to problem. So we're going to take all the variables that are changing, pressure, volume, and temperature, and move them over to one side, P over BB over T, and that's going to be equal to n times r, which, is a con which are constants. All right, so we start with the ideal gas equation, the only equation that we need to know at this point. We move everything that's changing over to one side, everything that's constant over the other side. And then remember that when, when a collection of variables is equal to a constant, we can then write that in this form, p1, v1 over t1 equals p2, v2 over t2. All right, so this is called this is called a combined gas equation, where we're taking really two gas laws here, Boyle's law and Charles' law, and combining them into one. We can get that just by starting with PV equals nRT. You don't have to remember this is a separate equation. So everything that's changing, we set the initial and final states equal to each other, and now we just have to solve for what we're looking for, which is the final volume V2. So assuming I did my, my algebra correct, V2 is going to be P1V1 times T2 divided by T1 times P2. So, so we're just doing a little bit more algebra to solve for V2. And now we can start plugging in variables. And the nice thing is because now we have a ratio of two pressures, it doesn't matter what volume unit we use. We can use milliliters, liters, whatever. As long as the two are the same, the units will divide out. Temperature still always has to be in Kelvin, so that one's non-negotiable. And then the volume we can put in at whatever we want as well because it's there's no universal gas constant we have to worry about in this equation. So the pressures are given in tor, so we'll put those in directly. We have 912 tors, the first pressure, P1. The initial volume is 255 milliliters. And then T2 is the final temperature, which is minus 23 degrees Celsius. So we have to put those into Kelvin. So we add 273. That's going to be 250 Kelvin is, T, is T2. And then T1 is the initial temperature, which is 25 Celsius. So that's 
that's 298 Kelvin. You'll see that one a lot because that's sort of approximately room temperature. It's in a warm room. And then so 298 Kelvin, and then P2 is the final pressure, 2.28 Tor. So the Tor cancels out, Kelvin cancels out, and so we're going to get a value that's in milliliters, the only unit that's left. So it's going to be 85,570 milliliters, which is maybe more conveniently stated as 85.6 liters. Again, I didn't specify here, although I guess all the answer choices are in liters, so we should convert to that. And that choice A in this multiple choice example. So the balloon expands from 255 milliliters, which is maybe about the size of your fist, to 85.6 liters, which is 20 gallons. Unless this is the world's stretchiest balloon, it's probably going to pop under these conditions. Um, but in theory, that's what the volume would expand to under, these, under this situation. So we use the ideal gas equation to derive a new equation in terms of the variables that are changing. And we solve for one of them that we're interested in, in this case, V2. And in this case, again, the units don't matter as much because we're not using R as part of this calculation. We can keep our pressure in TOR. We can keep our volume in milliliters. Temperature is the only one that has to be in a certain unit, which is Kelvin. All right, questions on that one? All right, let's see another example of this. This one, um, this one gets a little bit cute, but it shows that we can manipulate things even further in some cases. So here we have an ideal gas in a cylinder with a movable piston. So the, to picture that, we have a cylinder of gas that has you know, a top and a bottom, of course, to contain the gas. So that's an approximate drawing of a cylinder. And then the cylinder has a movable piston, which means that this top part here, this top surface, can move up and down. So it's expandable or contractible, but the volume is still contained by that top surface. So we have a, a movable piston, which means the height of the cylinder can change. And so we're told that the initial pressure is 355 torr. The height is 10 inches. What will be the height of the cylinder if the pressure of the gas is 760 torr? And we're given the volume of the cylinder is pi r squared h. All right, so for a cylinder, we have, again, the radius of the, of the circle on top is r, and then the height of the cylinder is h. And in this problem, because we have a movable piston, the height, the height can change. That, that top surface can move up and down to change the height of the cylinder. And that's how the volume would then change. All right, so we're going to set up this problem in the same way. We start with PV equals nRT. Now, there's a couple ways we could do this. We could use this just like we did before. And we know that the volume is changing because the height of the cylinder is changing. But we could take this one step further if we want to and rewrite volume as pi squared rh. So we're given the volume of a cylinder is pi, sorry, pi r squared h. So the pressure times pi r squared h is equal to nRT. So we can rewrite this in this way uh, to, to make things a little bit simpler at the end. The constants in this problem so we, we, know, we know that the pressure is changing. We know that the height is changing. But the number of moles, again, is not changing. It's a closed container. R is always a constant. We're not told anything about the temperature. So we'll assume that the temperature is constant. And then in the, rewrite, re, the rewritten form of the equation with pi r squared h is volume, pi is a constant. And then radius is a constant as well because the radius of the cylinder is not changing. Just the height of the cylinder is changing. So we can rewrite the equation a little bit. And then again, everything that's constant, we want to keep track of and move that to one side. So the only variables that are changing are the pressure and the height of the cylinder. So we rewrite this equation. Pressure times the height is equal to nRT over pi r squared. And all of those variables are constant. And then just like we did in the last problem, if we have a set of variables that are equal to a constant, the initial and final states are equal to each other when they're multiplied together. So P1H1 equals P2H2. All right, so we've decomposed this into a very simple equation because only the pressure and the height are changing. So we can derive an equation that involves just those two variables. Um, all right, so the, the final height H2, which is what we're solving for, is going to be P1H1 over P2. So we're just going to take this equation and rearrange it and solve for the final height, H2. So the initial pressure is 355 torr. 
the initial height is 10 inches. And then the final pressure is 760 torr. So the height of the cylinder will be 4.67 inches. So in other words, we're to, to change the pressure from 355 torr to 760, we would have to take this top cylinder here and compress it down, which should make sense to us because we know that there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. If the pressure is going up, the volume of the cylinder has to go down, which means we have to lower that top surface or make the volume smaller. All right, so this one was a little bit more involved, and um, but we can see now that in any situation, if we're able to arrange all of the constant variables onto one side, we can derive an equation involving whatever is changing. And this one we could have done it a little bit different way. We could have just solved for volume and then related that to pi r squared h to find the new height, but that would have been a little bit of extra work. We would have had to you know, use pi r squared h a couple times to first find the initial volume and then use it again to solve for the height for the final volume. There would be a lot of extra steps in there. So by rearranging the equations first, we can make it a much simpler form and uh, make the math a little bit easier on us. All right, questions on that? All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about, uh, I guess we should do one more and then we'll talk about a couple of new things. Here we have a gas cylinder with a fixed volume which has 239 moles of H2 and then the pressure of 136 atmospheres. 176 moles of hydrogen are removed from the cylinder. What is the new pressure reading? All right, so same story here. We have a sample of gas where some of the variables are changing. In this case, pressure and number of moles, which is what we're told about. PV equals NRT. And in this problem, again, anything we're not told about. So the temperature is constant. The cylinder has a fixed volume. In this case, we don't have a movable, expandable uh, volume. So the volume is constant. R is always a constant. All right, so we, we, we we're mindful of which variables are not changing. And so we rewrite everything where all the variables that are changing are on one side, pressure and number of moles. All the variables that are constant, we move to the other side. All right, and so the equation then that we're going to write is P1 divided by N1 equals P2 divided by N2. Okay, when we did the individual gas laws on Friday, we saw that there was an equation that relates volume and number of moles. We didn't have a separate equation for pressure and number of moles, but we can use the ideal gas law to find what that is. P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. So everything that's changing, we write a new equation involving those. We're solving for the final pressure, which is P2. So that's going to be P1 times N2 over N1. All right, here's where we have to be a little bit careful with the information that's given to us. So N2 and N1, these number of moles, those are the number of moles that are actually in the container. So we know that N1 is going to be 239 moles. That's the initial number that we have. But then N2 is going to be what's left. So here we're told that we're removing 176 moles. That's how much is removed. So the value for N2 is going to be our initial value, 239, minus 176 moles. So when we're using the ideal gas equation, remember it's the number of moles of gas that are in the sample, not the number of moles that we've removed. So N2 is going to be 63 moles. So our initial pressure is 136 atmospheres. The final number of moles is 63. We started with 239, that's N1. And so we get 36 atmospheres is our final pressure. All right, and, and the answer should make sense to us. If we have a cylinder of gas and we remove a bunch of gas for it, from it, the pressure should go down. We have less gas in there. And hopefully those are starting to make sense. All right, so that's one last example of using the ideal gas law to derive a new equation and then solve for one of the variables that's changing. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about is very much related to this. So now we've seen the ideal gas equation. We've seen some ways to sort of use it in its original form. Now let's see some other ways that we can apply it to other properties of gases. So one property we're going to talk about is the density of a gas. So we can write an equation for the density of a gas which also starts with the ideal gas law. PV equals nRT. Now remember that density is the mass per unit volume. So if we want to rewrite this equation in terms of mass, which term in here is most closely related to mass? Moles, right? So, so this value of N here, 
we can rewrite it as the mass divided by the molar mass, a calculation that we've used thousands of times in this course now. So we're going to rewrite this where m is the mass in grams, and then mw is what we call, again, the molar mass, the mass of one mole. So we rewrite the ideal gas equation in terms of mass. So pressure times the volume is going to be mass divided by molar mass times RT. So we've just substituted N for M mass divided by molar mass. And so that means if we want to solve for density, remember the definition of density is mass divided by volume. So we're going to move mass over volume over to one side, and then that leaves on the other side pressure times molar mass divided by RT. All right, so this is, here is the equation for the density of a gas, which depends on its pressure and its temperature and just the molar mass of the gas. Okay, so this is the equation for density. So we can use the ideal gas law to get that. Now we have an equation for density that we're going to also be able to use. So let's do an example of that. What is the density of ammonia gas, NH3, in grams per liter if we have a pressure of 500 torr and a temperature of 300 Celsius? So the density equation that we just derived is pressure times molar mass divided by RT. Now in this case, remember that as we said about in the first problem, if we're using the value of R in our calculation, we're using the universal gas constant to help us calculate density, we need to make sure we have the correct units for everything. So our pressure needs to be in atmospheres because we're using the value of R, which is in liters and atmospheres. So our pressure in atmospheres is 500 torr, we convert that to atmospheres using 760 torr per atmosphere. So the pressure we're going to use is 0 0.658 atmospheres. The molar mass of NH3, as a review of how to calculate molar mass, which we should all know how to do now, is just going to be 14.01, which is the atomic mass of nitrogen, plus three times the atomic mass of hydrogen. That's going to be 17.03. Remember the units for that are grams per mole. So that's the molar mass. R is the universal gas constant. And then finally, the temperature needs to be in Kelvin for this to work, just like any gas calculation. So our temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, which is approximately human body temperature. And then 273 Kelvin, so plus 273 to get this into Kelvin. So that's going to be 310 Kelvin. So when we, when we do the math, we should look at the units closely. So atmospheres cancel out, moles cancels, Kelvin cancels. We're left with grams per liter, which is the unit that we want for this. And that's going to be the standard unit for gas densities. 0 0.440 grams per liter. All right, so that's going to be the number. It's, it's fun to think about the number. Remember that when we first introduced gases last week, we talked about how one of the, the basic properties of a gas is that it has low density. So let's think about this number here. The density of water, as we all know, is one gram per milliliter. And the density of this sample of gas, which is at a reasonable, you know, reasonable pressure and at approximately the temperature of a hot Houston day. So the, 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 de the density of this is 0.44 grams per liter. So it's almost a thousand, over a thousand times smaller than the density of water. So gases tend to have very small densities, which are measured in grams per liter, whereas solids and liquids that we've been talking about in other contexts have densities that are typically reported in grams per milliliter. So they are a lot smaller, and this is a pretty typical value that you'll get for a sample of a gas. All right, so that's just a, a little minor extension of the ideal gas equation using it to calculate densities. Okay, and then um, I guess one last thing I'll point out about this, which I don't have an example problem of. Because we have molar mass as one of our variables here, we could also give you the density and have you solve for molar mass, and now this is sort of another way of identifying unknown substance. So remember that we can use molar mass to help us identify an unknown substance. So if we give you an unknown sample of gas where we measure its density, we can use that to solve for molar mass, and that's another sort of slight variation on this type of problem. So 
So what we're going to finish with for the rest of today is talking about gas stoichiometry. So stoichiometry is a topic that will never die for at least the next chapter or so. Um, and we're going to talk about how we use the ideal gas equation when doing problems involving gases that are, that are you know, stoichiometric in nature. So the, the whole idea of stoichiometry, as we've been trying to emphasize as we've been going through chapter 5, chapter 6, and now com coming back to it again in chapter 8, is that it's all about relationships involving number of moles. So we have a bunch of different ways now of calculating the number of, mar of number of moles. We started with the definition of a mole, which is Avogadro's number. And so if you have the number of particles or the number of entities, whether it's you know, atoms, molecules, ion, whatever you're reacting to species, the number of moles is the number of entities divided by Avogadro's number. All right, so that's one relationship that we've used many times, Avogadro's number. We know that there's this relationship between mass and number of moles that we've used many, many times in stoichiometry problems. So if you have the mass in grams and you divide it by the molar mass, that gives you number of moles. In chapter six, we started talking about solution stoichiometry, which is where if you have molarity and volume, that gives you number of moles. Where this capital M again is molarity. So that was one of the, the key parts about chapter six. And then finally, now we're talking about gases, the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. And so we have a relationship here, N is, the, is going to be PV divided by RT. All right, so this brings up one important point about gas phase reactions, which is something that can help you on some of the homework problems. I don't think I have one in this set of notes that will be directly using this concept. But, but keep in mind that we have this equation here. N is proportional to the pressure and the volume. So it's directly proportional to both pressure and volume. So what that means is that if we have a gas phase equation, let's say we do, um, let's say we do Cl2 gas plus H2 gas reacts to form 2HCl gas, okay? So let's say we have a gas phase equation Remember that the, the traditional way of interpreting this when we were doing stoichiometry problems before is that one mole of Cl2 reacts with one mole of H2 to form two moles of HCl. Okay, so that's kind of the, you know, that's the, the, tip, the typical way that we interpret these, these chemical equations. But because the number of moles for a gas is proportional to the pressure and the volume, if we have a constant volume and a constant temperature, we could then in, reinterpret this as one atmosphere of Cl2 reacts with one atmosphere of H2 to form two atmospheres of HCl if the pressure and the, and the, sorry, if the volume and the temperature are constant. Or if the pressure and the temperature are constant, we could write it as one liter of Cl2 reacts with one liter of H2 to make two liters of HCl. So for gas phase reactions, we can interpret the coefficients in terms of number of moles, which is the standard way that we do it, or in terms of the pressure or the volume of each reactants because the number of moles is directly related to those two quantities. So the mole ratios are going to be equal to the pressure ratios that react and the volume ratios. The pressure part might not make a lot of sense now. We'll talk about partial pressures next time. That'll come more clear. But for volume, we can see how that works. So if we, re if we react one liter of Cl2 with one liter of H2, that will make two liters of HCl provided we keep the pressure and the temperature constant throughout the reaction because the number of moles is directly related to the volume. Okay, so that's sort of a new way of interpreting chemical equations that will be helpful when we're doing gas phase stoichiometry problems. But before we get into that, let's start with um, sort of a multi-step example, or I guess a couple examples here. So the first one here is um, a little bit different. So let's start with this one. It's, it's a gas stoichiometry problem. We are doing a chemical reaction, but we're not really going to use the number of moles directly, as we'll see. So let's say we have this reaction here, N2 and F2 combined in a 1 to 3 mole ratio. So the stoichiometric coefficients are 1 and 3, so that means if we combine them in a 1 to 3 mole ratio, they're going to react completely, and they're going to form 2 NF3. And the total pressure is 1.25 atmospheres. If the reaction is carried out at constant temperature and volume, what is the final pressure at the end of the reaction? So here we're, we have the... the the volume and the temperature are constant. We want to know what's the final pressure when all of our 1.25 atmospheres of reactants to reacts to form the products that we have here. So this is going to be related to PV equals nRT. And in this case, we don't know really any of the exact values except for the total pressure, which is 1.25 atmospheres. That's the only value we know. So the pressure and the number of moles is going to be changing. 
because as we go through this chemical reaction, we have one, in a, in a one mole of N2, three moles of F2, forming two moles of Na, NF3. So after the reaction is over, we're going to have a different amount of gas than we started with because there's different coefficients on the reactants in the product side. And there was a couple of homework problems in the previous homework that dealt with this concept as well, the, the number of moles of gas changing during a reaction. So pressure and number of moles are going to change, but the R, T over V term is going to be constant because R is always a constant, and we're told directly that temperature and volume are constant. So P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. We're solving for the final pressure, which is P2. It's going to be P1 times N2 over N1. Now, the issue that we have here is that we don't know the individual values of, for number of moles. We know the pressure that we're starting with is 1.25 atmospheres, but all we know about the number of moles is that it's a 1 to 3 mole ratio. And, but it, the key point is that if we put these in at a 1 to 3 mole ratio, all of these reactants are going to convert into products. So N2 is going to be the moles of product. N1 is going to be moles of reactant that we start with. We don't know the exact numbers, but the ratio comes from the coefficient in the balanced reaction. So all we really need is this ratio here of N2 divided by N1. So we can use the coefficients in the balanced reaction to tell us the ratio of the moles of reactants and the moles of product, or, or I guess vice versa. So the moles of product is just going to be the coefficients in front of the gas phase product. So there's only one gas phase product. It has a coefficient of 2. So two moles of product form, and that's going to be two moles of product for how many moles of reactant. It's total moles that we're interested in, so it's going to be one mole of N2, three moles of F2, so we get four moles of product. So we don't know that these are the exact number of moles that are involved, but we do know that the ratio, no matter what we're starting with, is going to be two to four, or one to two, because for every four moles of gases that we react, we're going to form two moles as a product. We know that the two gases are added at a one to three ratio, so they're going to react completely to form products. So at the end, we're only going to have the product. And so this ratio is going to be valid for us. So the ratio of, of products to reactants is two to four. And so we take our initial pressure, 1.25 atmospheres, multiply it by that ratio, two moles of product for every four moles of reactant that we put in, equals 0 0.625 atmospheres. So in some sense, this wasn't really a gas stoichiometry problem because we weren't calculating exact amounts of substances that were involved in the reaction. But we did need to use the concept of stoichiometry to help us here because we need the ratio of moles of product to moles of reactant. And in any stoichiometry problem, that can come directly from the coefficients in the balanced reaction. Okay, so that one sort of introduces the concept. But now the last one we're going to do, which has several steps involved, is going to look at different ways we can use the ideal gas equation when doing multi-step stoichiometry problems. All right, so let's look at All right, so we have this, this situ situation here. We're doing a reaction between pH3, which is called phosphine, and O2, oxygen. And they react to form P2O5, which is a solid, and then water vapor when the reaction is carried out at a high temperature. So the way that we carry out gas phase reactions in a lab is we start with the two gases that are in separate bulbs here, A and B. And then they're closed off from each other by this valve C. Um, now, this type of valve is called a stopcock. Please don't laugh. And then, um, so the A and B are isolated from each other by a valve. We open the valve, and then the two are allowed to mix with each other and react. So initially, they're separated by a closed valve. We open the valve up, and A and B are allowed to mix and react with each other. So that's sort of the mechanics of how we would do a, a reaction in the gas phase if we wanted to study it. So we're starting with, as the problem tells us, we have this bulb here has a volume of 12.5 liters, and it has a pressure of 2.00 atmospheres of the gas, pH 3. And then this bulb here has a volume of 10 liters, and the, volume, and the pressure is adjusted to 3 atmospheres. So we have pressure and volume for each of our reactants. They're initially closed off. We open the valve and allow the two to react. So you know, this is a, a multi-step problem, and so we're going to take you through sort of one step at a time. So if we're doing a gas phase reaction, just like any soil geometry problem, the first thing we should figure out is how many moles of each reactant are present. So we're going to be doing a reaction between these two. I think the last question I'm going to end up asking you is, you know, what is the total pressure at the end of the reaction? We can figure out, you know, how much product is formed. There's a lot of different things we can ask you. 
But the first step is going to be how many moles of each gas are there. This is where the ideal gas equation helps us. So we rewrite the gas, ideal gas equation and find that the number of moles is pressure times the volume divided by RT. All right, so we, for each of the gases, we can do that to find how many moles there are. So the moles of a of pH 3 are going to be, we have two atmospheres of that gas. That's, that's going to be bulb A, as I've labeled them. The pressure for that, or the volume for that one is 12.5 liters. And then we use RT 0. 0.0821 is R. And the temperature for both of them starts out at 400 Kelvin. That's going to be the temperature for the reaction. So 400 Kelvin. So we have 0 0.761 moles of phosphine, pH 3. Alright, so this shows us how if we're doing a slope geometry problem, which I haven't really you know, asked the question that we're going to be dealing with that yet, but the first thing we can always do, just like any slope geometry problem, is figure out moles of reactant. We have two reactants, let's figure out the moles of each. So the number of moles for O2, we have three atmospheres of O2, that occupies a volume of 10 liters and then the same RT term. And 400 Kelvin. So we have 0 0.914 moles of O2. All right, so what we're going to work towards first is what is the number, what's the amount of product that can be formed? And so if we allow the two gases to mix with each other, we want to find out which one is the limiting reactant. So if we're going to now start doing any calculations about the reaction itself, once we allow the two gases to react, if we're going to calculate how much product is formed, if we're going to calculate how much reactant is left over, we need to know which one of those two is the limiting reactant. So that's going to be the next step in this, which gas is the limiting reactant. So this kind of reintroduces and reviews that topic. So we found on the first part that the number of moles of each, we had 0 0.761 for pH 3. We had 0 0.914 for O2. Remember that the number of moles does not directly tell us which one's the limiting reactant. We have to divide the number of moles by the coefficient in the balanced reaction. And we call that the stoichiometric ratio. So for pH 3, we take the number of moles, which is 0.761, and divide by its coefficient, which is 2 in the chemical reaction, chemical equation. So that's going to be 0 0.38, which you only need two decimal places to, to do this. And then for O2, we have 0 0.914 moles. We divide by the coefficient for O2, which is 4, and that comes out to 0 0.23. So this is the smaller number. Remember, when we take the number of moles and divide by the coefficient, whichever one comes out as the smaller number is going to be the limiting reactant. So O2 is the limiting reactant in this problem. All right, so we're using this really the same concept as before with any other stoichiometry problem. It's just that we use the ideal gas equation to calculate the number of moles instead of the other relationships that we've been using previously. So now that we know the, the limiting reactant, we can then start asking questions about the reaction itself. So let's look at part C, which is how many grams of P2O5 are formed. So if we're going to calculate how much product is formed, P2O5 is one of our products, we of course have to start with the limiting reactant. So the mass of P2O5 in grams, we have our limiting reactant is O2, and as we calculated, there's 0.914 moles of O2. And then this calculation is exactly what we did before with, with stoichiometry. So we use the the molar ratios to figure out how many moles a product forms. So the coefficient for P2O5 is 1. The coefficient for O2 is 4. So they react in a 1 to 4 ratio. 1 mole of P2O5 forms for every 4 moles of O2 that reacts. And then if we want to find the mass of P2O5, we use its molar mass, which is given to us as 141.94 grams of P2O5 in one mole of P2O5, that converts into grams. So when these two gases are allowed to react, we can form 32.4 grams of P2O5. All right, so let's not forget everything we learned before, because once we have number of moles, we can treat it like any other stoichiometry problem. 
the next step then is to figure out how many moles of each gas are present after the reaction. So that's part D here, how many moles of each gas are present after the reaction. So we look at the balanced chemical equation, there are three gases. There's pH3 and O2, which are the reactants, and then one of our products, H2O, also exists as a gas. So we want to know how many moles of each of those gases are left at the very end. So the one that's easy is the number of moles of O2. So without doing any calculations, how much O2 is left at the end of the reaction? None. And that's because O2 is the limiting reactant. So whatever our limiting reactant reacts completely, so there's not going to be any O2 left over. But now we're going to have pH3 is our excess reactant, so there's going to be some of that remaining. And then we also have H2O being formed as a product, so we have to calculate those two. How many moles of pH3 are left over? How many moles of H2O form? So remember that for the excess reactant, we first calculate how much is consumed. So the moles of pH3 that's going to be consumed in the reaction, we start with our limiting reactant always when we're doing these calculations. So we have 0.914 moles of O2 is our limiting reactant. And then pH3 and O2 react in a 2 to 4 ratio. So 2 moles of pH3 reacts for every 4 moles of O2. And those are just the coefficients from the chemical equation. And so that means we're consuming 0.457 moles of pH3. All right, and this number, again, does not tell us how much pH3 is left over. It tells us how much was consumed during the chemical reaction. So if we want to look for the amount of pH3 that's in excess, we have to take the amount that we started with and subtract that number. So we started with 0.761 moles of pH3. We calculated that in the very first part of this problem. We reacted 0 0.457, 0 0.457 moles were consumed, and so what's left over is 0 0.304 moles of pH3. All right, so that's how much pH3 is left over at the end of the reaction. 0.457 moles reacted, and that was out of the initial 0.761 that we started with, so that's what's left over. And then finally for the moles of water, water is another product of our reaction, so we can use the limiting reactant and the mole ratios to figure out how many moles of water formed. So our limiting reactant is O2, 0.914 moles of O2, and then the, react, the, water, the water forms in a mole ratio of 3 to 4. So 3 moles of water form for every 4 moles of O2 that react. All right, so that's given here, 3, o, three waters for every 4 O2s, 3 to 4 ratio. And so that means we're going to be forming 0 0.686 moles of H2O. Okay? So that's part D here, how many moles of each gas are present at the end of the reaction. We use stoichiometry then to do that, where again, now we've already used the ideal gas law, we don't have to use that anymore to just do the, the regular stoichiometry calculations like we've always done. Now the last step here, which is where we have to bring the ideal gas law back into it, is what is the total pressure at the end of the reaction? Okay, so we started with two individual gases where we knew their pressure and volume. We allowed them to mix together. They formed a product that was a solid and another product that was a gas. There's going to be some of this left over. So what's the total pressure at the end of the reaction? Something we'll talk in more detail about next time, so this is a good way to dovetail into that, is the total pressure for any mixture of gases. So now we have a mixture of two gases. We have excess pH3 and we have the water that forms. So we have two gases mixed together. The total pressure is just going to be the total number of moles times RT divided by V. All right, so for the ideal gas equation, it doesn't matter what the identity of the gas is. It's just the total number of moles that matter. So if we have the number of moles of just one gas, we can use PV equals NRT to calculate its pressure. But if we have a mixture of gases and we know the total number of moles of all the gases that are in that mixture, we can use that also to calculate pressure using PV equals NRT. So it doesn't matter if there's two different gases. As long as we know the total number of moles, we can use that. All right, so the total number of moles in total is going to be whatever's left over at the end of the reaction. Here we're talking about the pressure at the end. So as we saw that there's 0 0.304 moles of pH3 left over. That's one of the gases that's present, and the other one that's present is water, which exists as a gas at 400 Kelvin. We saw that we formed 0.686 moles of water in the last step. So the total number of moles of gas is 0 0.990. Okay, so that's the number that's gonna go up here. 
R is the universal gas constant. Temperature is still the same, 400 Kelvin. We're keeping the temperature constant during the reaction. And then we need to put the volume down here. So here's again where we have to be a little bit careful. Once we open this valve and allow the two gases to mix, the final volume is going to be the sum of the volumes of A and B because the gases that are now present have access to this entire volume here, the combined volume of the two. So the final volume is going to be the sum of the two, 12.5 liters, which is the volume of bulb A, and then 10.0 liters, which is the volume of the second bulb. So at the, at the end of the reaction, once everything is done, the gases occupy a volume of 22.5 liters. They are free to move about this entire container as long as we leave the valve open at the end of the reaction. So that's the volume that we're going to put in here, 22.5 liters. And so that calculates, allows us to calculate a pressure then of 1.44 atmospheres. All right, so we can use the ideal gas law to find moles of each reactant and product. We use stoichiometry to convert between them. And then once we know what's present at the end, we can go back to the ideal gas law to calculate pressure. So we'll talk in more detail next time about mixtures of gases and some other related topics. And so I'll see you on Wednesday.